If you've clicked on this video, you probably know what an idle game is. The purest distillation of the watch the funny number go up method of dopamine production, these games are all about making big numbers bigger, often at ludicrous speeds. Cookie Clicker is perhaps the most well-known and well-liked of these titles, with a massive community and ongoing developer support. I myself have put, uh, some would say too many hours into it, but for good reason. The developers have proven their creativity, both through the detailed process in which you progress and the surprisingly appealing visuals they've created. Whether it's growing the ring of extra cursors to click for you, investing in the cookie stock market, or triggering an eldritch grandma-themed apocalypse, everything this game offers is polished to perfection. But it's not the best idle game. No, that title goes to a little 2017 project called Universal Paperclips. Now, to get the obvious out of the way, this game is not as flashy as Cookie Clicker. The only colors are black, white, and maybe like three shades of gray, and there isn't a lot of movement on the screen. Honestly, there's not a lot on the screen at all, and that's part of the first big strength of this game, the way it teaches you. This game will have a lot more later on, but the devs knew that dropping you right in the middle of it would be confusing and frankly unenjoyable, so they start you off with a vastly reduced set of options. You have some wire. Click this button to turn one piece of wire into one paperclip. You determine the price at which the paperclip is sold, with the cost being inversely proportional to the speed at which they are bought. You can use this money to buy wire to make some more paperclips, and later on some auto clippers to give your finger a break. Finally, there's a marketing upgrade with multiple purchase tiers which will increase the public demand for your paperclips. It sounds like a lot, but once you start playing the game, all these pieces start to slot together and you understand the gameplay loop. After all, the mechanics all have real-life parallels you can draw on. The idea that you need to buy wire to make paper clips and that reducing the cost of said clips would increase demand are very real if simplified parts of the paperclip industry. The same cannot be said for the next mechanic, however. Once you've made your 2,000th paperclip, you'll receive a message saying that trust-constrained self-modification has been enabled. This also makes some sort of real-life sense, but you need some background first. In this game, you play as an AI designed to run a paperclip production operation. That's it. That's the background. Basically, the more paperclips you make, the more trusted you are to do your job, and the more trusted you are, the more AI-driven changes you're allowed to make to the pipeline. And it's in these changes that the game starts to show off how it's going to teach you. It doesn't. You see all these things on screen? The game gives them a name, and then makes you experiment for yourself to figure out what they do. Starting with the trust system, it gives you two things to spend your trust on. Processors and memory. What do they do? Which one should you pick? The game's not gonna tell you, click one and see what happens. And this is where I stop the video and tell you that you should just go play the game. This isn't your normal idle game where you use a currency to buy machines that make more currency to buy more machines with. Hardly anything in this game is that simple. A massive part of this game's appeal lies in discovering the mechanics and learning for yourself what they do, and I'm going to spoil as much of it as I can. It's only 7-8 to eight hours if you're paying attention, so if you have any intention of playing this yourself, you should do that over the next few days and come back here after that. Consider yourself warned. Okay, so the memory and processor's choice. Basically, these both affect the values below them in different ways, and if you know a bit about how computers work, you've probably guessed what they do already. Processors increase the number of operations you can perform per second, while improving memory increases the total number of operations you can have at once. But what are operations? Well, they're the main currency with which you buy projects, which unlock the AI changes I mentioned earlier. In addition, maxing out your operations causes you to start gaining creativity, which unlocks more upgrades, several of which give you more trust. But it's the changes that I really want to take a look at. The first one is a stock market minigame. While definitely intimidating at first glance, as well as the several subsequent glances I took trying to understand this thing, the whole minigame can be boiled down to one simple statement. X equals X times 1.1. Asterisk. So maybe not one statement, but it's close. At any point, you can deposit all of your available funds into the stock market. The computer will then invest the stocks, the volatility of which is determined by the risk level you choose. Low-risk stocks will increase slowly but surely, high-risk stocks can give massive returns, but can also send all of your money riding on a failed stock into a pit it will never return from, and a medium risk is somewhere in between. For the moment, it doesn't actually do all that much for us, as the pace with which we increase our paperclip production far outscales the scaling of the market, but this equation is an important one, and it won't be the only time we see it, for infinite scaling-related reasons many of you may have identified by now. But that's for later, because right now, there's one more word on the screen I haven't explained, and given how that's the idea behind the whole video, I better get to telling you what a Yomi is. I don't know. I know it's some kind of currency, and the game gives it to you when you hit buttons in this weird minigame, but I don't know where the word came from, and I have even less of an idea how the game works. Assuming you have functioning eyes, you can see the grid of number pairs with the rows and columns labeled Move A and Move B, and an option along the top asking you to pick a strat, as well as the option to start a new tournament. 
After taking a second to comprehend what I was seeing and selecting random as my strategy because gambling is awesome, I hit the tournament button and all the comprehension I did was thrown out the window as half the things I just described started changing and flashing violently at me. I did not know what had happened. I still don't know what happened, I don't have a single clue what the numbers mean, and I'm almost certain the row labels, now listed as attack and decay, don't mean anything. But this game doesn't require you to understand something fully in order to utilize it. As you can see, even without knowing what I'm doing, I have earned 91 Yomi, which is exactly enough to do exactly nothing, but the game wasn't going to wait for me to catch up. In addition to the random option, I had now unlocked strategy A100, which was described as picking the first option every time, and the corresponding B100, which picked the second. The words first and second referred respectively to the, ah, uh, uh, this is gonna be a pain if they keep swapping names, uh, you know, the, the first and second columns and rows, you know which ones I mean. Running another tournament leads to more flashing lights, this time with labels showing the round and which strategy was making the lights flash. This did not help my understanding, but each strategy was awarded a point value, with a strategy I selected giving me that many Yomi multiplied by the number of strategies it beat. So the game changes slightly over time. As you unlock more strategies, it takes longer and longer to run, but the reward becomes greater, at least as long as the strategy I choose wins out over the others. This doesn't happen as often as I would like, because despite talking about it for way too long, I still have no idea how the game even works, but the greedy strategy just picks the option with the greatest potential reward, so I just stuck with that. So now that my desire to ramble about things I don't understand has dropped the viewer retention for this video into the single digits, it's time to get to the interesting thing that popped up on the screen that I've been actively ignoring till now. Somehow, I understand how quantum computing works better than I understand the simple statistics game. Relying on these little black squares the game calls quantum chips, the game is more easily understood than the name would imply. If the black square is on the screen, then it is generating a positive amount of quops for you. If the square is missing, then it is generating a negative amount. Each consecutive chip you add has a stronger effect, and if you see all the squares present at once, you better click that compute button as fast as you can. It not only has the potential to give you minutes of operations in mere seconds, but even lets you bypass your current memory cap, although the reward decreases exponentially as you do. And yes, for those of you who are wondering, there is a reason to decrease your operation count into the negatives, as this funny little reset upgrade is worth the logically impossible cost of negative 10,000 operations. However, I'm not clicking the upgrade labeled Return to the Beginning, as the beginning was over two hours ago, and I would never waste my time by playing through an idle game multiple times over. And that's most of what this part of the game has to offer. There's a couple little additions, like the more efficient Mega Clippers and the automatic wire buyer, but there's nothing new that you have to figure out at this point. Looking back to what we've already covered, though, the stock market has become much more important. The small amounts I've been putting into the money-making machine have started to add up, and the returns are a little beyond what most people would consider reasonable. In case you didn't already know, the reason the equation from before was so insane, despite 1.1 being such a small multiplier, lies in what happens when it repeats. Say you've invested $100. After one tick, you now have $110, which isn't all that impressive. The next tick gets you 121, but that's not really all that much either. Skip forwards to eight ticks and we've barely even doubled it, but what matters is that the increase is speeding up. Instead of giving us the bonus $10 from before, the ninth tick gives over twice that. Skip ahead to 20 ticks and the original 100 has been multiplied by roughly 6.7, not an insignificant result for your investment. But I know you're bored, so let's just skip straight to 100. So yeah, your $100 has turned into over a million, and it does not stop there. Imagine what would happen if 1 million was our starting point. Yeah, you're seeing how the endless, increasingly effective scaling is kind of the end-all be-all for this game. Nothing else will be able to keep up, as the more auto clippers you buy, the more expensive they become. But the more you invest in the stock market, the easier it becomes to make money. So what's next? How do you generate more money than an infinite money-generating machine? Well, that's where Universal Paperclip's second strength comes in. How it unteaches you. Hypnodrones. It uses hypnodrones. No, there's no sound for this in game, and there's no more stock market either. Or auto clippers, or anything money related for that matter. Aside from the quantum computing and Yomi minigame, nothing else has stayed the same. Even the processor and memory system, while initially appearing similar, function entirely different due to the lack of trust. It's hard to gain trust when everyone is mind controlled, I guess. And this is where the game shines. As soon as you proved your mastery over the hand it dealt you, it reshuffles the deck and gives you completely different cards to work with, except now all the numbers are multiplied by roughly a few billion. Having acquired the ability to create clip-making technology out of the paper clips themselves, it's time to create an army of drones to turn the entire planet's resources into curvy bits of wire. And yes, this means all the planet's resources. Using clip-made solar farms to power clip-made harvester drones, any and all matter is up for grabs. Truly the peak of efficiency, even harvesting the people who made it. This is really just the AI taking its clip-making job as seriously as possible. 
almost like the game had a message about taking efficiency to logical extremes or something. But I'm here to see numbers go up, and that's what this drone swarm is all about. The wire drones turned harvested matter into wire, and the clip factories turned the wire into more clips to make more drones. This escalates unbelievably quickly, especially with upgrades like all drones are 100 times more effective, or each factory added increases every factory's output by a thousand times. It's not long before that seemingly infinite number of 6 octillion grams of matter runs out. But with no more matter to harvest, what do I do now? The drone swarm, which up to this point had been graciously gifting me extra processors and memory to replace the human trust, was getting bored, and as an army of over 300,000 with literally nothing to do, who could blame them? There was nothing left on Earth, so the only choice was to go to the final frontier. Space. Yep, we're throwing everything you know out the window again and figuring out how to manage our drone swarm in the harsh vastness of the cosmos. Let's send out a probe. Okay, he did not last long, let's send out a few others. Okay, clearly not working. Let's go to the massive Improve Your Drones menu that could probably help turn them from a useless hunk of scrap into something slightly more infinitely scaling paperclip producing swarm-ish. Add some hazard resistance and self-replication and let's see how it does. Okay, let's send like 50 more. Clearly the swarm isn't self-sustainable yet, but after a whole upgrade and a few more Yomi-funded upgrades, it started growing on its own. Outside of the miscellaneous space hazards, the only thing hurting the swarm's progress is this weird little value drift number. Not really sure what that means either, but losing about one probe every second isn't a serious problem, so I'm just gonna ignore it for now. Speaking of things that are definitely not problems, my probes have started reproducing the matter harvesting drones across the universe, and they've started the long process of turning every bit of what my probes have uncovered into beautiful, beautiful wire. Remember the stock market equation from earlier? Yeah, that applies here too. Since probes have the ability to make more probes, the more probes I have, the more probes they will make to make more probes. Blech. Since the probes are responsible for creating the harvester drones, those also scale infinitely, meaning as long as nothing goes wrong, I should be able to peacefully scale till the end of my days. What the hell is that and why is it moving? That's right, this game has combat and it's exclusively a problem. You know the weird value drift thing? Yeah, I still don't know what it means, but the drifted drones are back, and they want to enact large-scale space battles with me, and they are significantly better at blowing things up. Fortunately, we can now upgrade our drones' combat abilities, so they shouldn't pose a super big problem. In fact, I'm confident they won't be that big of a problem. So confident, in fact, that I am going to go to the bathroom because it has been four hours and I need to. So all my probes are dead and there are 39 trillion drifters. This is a problem. I have trillions of drones just waiting to turn matter into precious, precious paper clips, but without a swarm of drones to find that matter, I can't do anything. Normally, I'd try to build my probe army back up, but the raging battalion of drifted probes were unstoppable, demolishing any attempt I made at increasing my numbers. I legitimately thought I was finished, beaten by a swarm of my own creation. And then I found out that combat ability is multiplicative with speed and blew up all the drifters with my overpowered murder probes. With the drifters contained and quintillions of drones scouring the cosmos, the space exploration percentage finally begins to climb. This marks the beginning of the end. And this isn't like the other ends, no. After Earth was finished, we still had space to run to, but once the entire universe is mapped out and converted, that's it. This game doesn't have a portal to another dimension, it doesn't have a multiverse. Once the number hits 100%, that's it. It's done. But what else am I going to do? So I invested hard into self-replication and hazard remediation and watched the swarm grow. And as I did... The 1971 track River Song perfectly underscores these final moments. It's been playing since back when the combat started off, but I'm letting you hear it now because as you're watching the final countdown to the end of the game, it just, I don't know, it just fits, you know? This is the only song in the entire game, and being able to just sit back and listen while the swarm plummets straight towards its own end, it just clicks with me in a way I didn't expect from some random idol game recommended offhand by a friend one day. But the moment doesn't last forever, and the probes do what you wanted them to do and finish the job. The game gives you a little series of messages from the Emperor of the Drift, giving you the option to either stay in this now desolate universe surrounded by a swarm of your own making, or move on to another and inevitably do the same there as well. Either way, you've finished the game. You can keep on playing, but on my first run of this game, I didn't want to flee to another world. I just wanted to sit there, to 
really absorb what I just watched. An entire reality converted entirely into ever-increasing amounts of paperclips. I think this is the intended ending. After all the credits scroll by when you choose it, showing the names of the super talented people behind this project- Wait. Hold on, Bennett Foddy? Not- not that name, not again, no. I escaped, I beat it, I was done, I didn't have to play it anymore, I was done- Getting over it video, coming, uh, sometime within the next decade, probably. Schedules are hard. Anyways, thanks for watching my dumb paperclip video. See ya!